Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com. today I was invited to go to a coob party but I couldn't make it and I because I had to milk so I invited the coob party here to the farm and we're gonna do kind of a fun tailgating theme for the veggie burgers I'm gonna be picking up some hazelnuts at New Forest Farm in Viola and then it's off to Valkyrie Brewing in Dallas for some good old-fashioned Viking beer gather with us around the farm table I'm your host Inga Witcher A few years ago, I moved up to Wisconsin. I started an organic dairy farm at St. Isidore's Mead. That's when I discovered the abundance of Midwestern local food and small-scale farmers, growing everything from green zebra tomatoes to pasture pork. I'm taking a break from the cows, hitting the road, and seeing if I can't satisfy my epicurious appetite. bulk tank here. This is a ice bank bulk tank from 1952 and it's still going strong just like my parents. It was the year they were born and I love it. I love these vintage style uh, farm equipment because they never give up. They never break. They just keep going and going and going. So every other day when I'm shipping milk I have to wash the milk tank because the milk truck driver comes every other day to pick up our milk. On a bigger dairies, they would clean bulk tanks with a whole different system. So you just kind of plug in this great little system into your uh, bulk tank and it does the work for you. Here, we have to do the work ourselves, but it's okay. It only takes a few minutes. And this way we can make sure that everything gets very clean. We're gonna head out to the pasture here when I get this sprayed out and we're gonna meet uh, Aaron and Eric who are Kube experts because I know you're probably wondering, what is Kube? What, what is this? So we're gonna go out there and talk to them in a little bit and find out just what it is. Bravo, I'm, yeah, well, it's, it's, what is this? This is the uh, Stap King. This is the King for the U.S. National Coupe Championship. And so every team that wins the U.S. Championship, they get their name on here. So, nice. So Aaron here, he's got his name on here. Nice. <laughs> so I'm kind of new to the game of coupe. My husband's a big coupe player, but I'm not. So tell me a little bit about the, what what is it? Well, it's, it's throwing blocks at, at other blocks. It's, uh, <laughs> Call it Viking chess is one other way to call it. How did you come to start playing coup? Uh My wife and I lived in Sweden for a year back in 2005, 2006. We just started introducing people to Kube as we met people. Aaron was one of the first people we introduced Kube to. And uh, that's how I learned about the game. And then it just kind of quickly has grown. And I know you guys know everybody. Well, I don't know about everybody, <laughs> but but a lot of people do know Coop, so that's uh, that's a great feeling. So Eau Claire is really that that hub of Coop here in the United States. Oh. Coop capital in North America. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Every year we host a championship at different events, and Coop Nation magazine is out of Eau Claire, and we got national champs from Eau Claire, and uh, it's just it's it's in the schools. I just I mean, want to do everywhere. a high five. I don't know if people still do Damn. high fives. Do I high think they do this things, but I always do high five. fives. Yeah, Good absolutely. job, guys. Yeah, yeah. So what is it about the game that really brings you guys back to it uh, every day? I play with my dad, with my son. Um, so it's a game that, that kind of uh, goes all, all ages. Um, I play with my daughter, um, all skill levels. So people who are new, 
when they see or hear or have that feeling of knocking something down, there's this hunger to do it again. Mm -hmm. So there's really a lot to offer in the game that can start out seeming really simple. Yeah. So are there any sort of basic rules to coop? I mean, the game is set up with the field or the pitch is eight meters by five meters. Mm -hmm. There's five coops on one side and five on the other. And the king, he sits in the middle. And so pretty much the whole object of the game is to take the wooden batons here. And you have to throw them under arm and they can't okay. go sideways at all. And you're trying to knock over the coops on your opponent's side over there that are eight meters away. Uh -huh. The coops that you knock over, they get thrown back into play later in the game. So the game goes back and forth, back and forth. And the king, he stands in the middle. He's like the eight ball. If you knock him over during the, during the game, you lose. But once you've eliminated all the coops on your opponent's side, then you can try to take down the king. Nice. And he, he's the easiest one to knock over. Well, I think it's the toughest shot in coop. No, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. because it's, it psychs you yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, I know that for us here, we always play coop just wherever on the farm. Kind of like, yeah. well, I usually watch Joe playing coop by himself, and I sit there pouting a little bit. <laughs> but it's we can play it in the pasture. We can play yeah. it uh, on the concrete. It's, it's kind of one of those games you can just take anywhere. You play it on the beach. You play it on the street, backyard. Um, you don't even need pieces sometimes if you really need to play. I mean, you can, I mean, these are these are pieces of, of wood. So um, it, it really is a game that can go anywhere, anytime. We play it in the winter. Some people around here ask, oh, you can play that in the summer? Yeah. <laughs> because it's, it's fun to play all the time. Well, guys, I'm going to be off to Valkyrie Brewery to get some beer because that's, I just want to be able to rehydrate you guys with a little bit of good Wisconsin oh, yeah. beer. We love Valkyrie. Yeah. The beer of Vikings. Yeah. The yeah. beer of Vikings. Yeah. Yes. And then I'm going to be uh, gathering some nuts for some veggie burgers. So if you guys wouldn't mind keeping track of the farm, um, if I'm not back in time, you guys are in charge of milking cows. Uh, we got everything. Yeah, yeah we can handle it. All right, I'll see you guys in a few hours. Thank you so much. Nice yeah, to appreciate see you. Thanks for coming yeah, out. Thank, thank you. you. So this is it is such an exciting moment for me that I get to taste beer with the makers of the beer. I, I think in the state of Wisconsin that probably happens quite a bit because we have so many microbrews here, but you guys oh, were yes. really the first the first microbrew in, brewer in Wisconsin. Yep, in well Western it was Wisconsin. Western Wisconsin. Okay. And here, we were we were the first ones in, so uh, it, was, it was an experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we came into Dallas and they were going, a micro what? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So tell me a little bit about the beer making process. Well, it uh, starts out with um, with um, malt, malted barley usually, uh, sometimes a little bit of malted wheat, um, and then we mill that, grind it, um, and then steep it in hot water and um, use the enzymes in the barley to convert the starches into sugar. Okay. And then we extract the sugars out of that and boil that, add in other spices and herbs into that, typically hops, at least hops, mm -hmm. into it, and then um, pitch yeast into it and ferment it. Nice. It <laughs> seems like a lot of these processes are similar to cheese making, and I'm just saying that because I've mm -hmm. just been making cheese forever, uh, where you, ha you, know, you add certain ingredients at certain times, mm -hmm. wait for the temperature to come to a certain time, and it's a lot of waiting uh, while you're working. And, uh, <laughs> but it's Brewing fun. is like that, yeah. yeah. There's a lot of waiting involved. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it like cheese where each batch is a little bit different? Yes. In, in a small brewery, you, you get to notice that because because we rarely brew the same beer batch back to back. Okay. Okay. Um, every batch is different, slightly. Mm -hmm. um, and it varies be, both because of the um, ingredients are varying. You're using agricultural products, so the, the, the makeup of the agricultural products sure. change things. And depending on what time of year it is. Because this building is, has great temperature swings in it, it, it's different in the winter than in the summer. I love that. So um, the big boys do the same thing, except they they have so much of the same beer that they blend the tanks to maintain the particular consistency. consistency. Huh. 
I think it's more fun if it doesn't have that same consistency. You know, the so it's yeah, that's the artisanal fun. part of it. Yeah. You know, everything ought to be a little bit different. I, I mean. it would be wonderful if in every small town like Dallas, Wisconsin, there was a uh, the, the local brewer, the local cheesemaker, the local butcher, and yep. we could kind of wouldn't it be amazing to get be back wonderful. to that way of like that? Get back there. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, and we'll, we'll, I think we're going to go back that direction, mm -hmm. the pendulum swinging back towards small. I hope so. so. <laughs> well, I'm going to get out of your hair before the tours start today. I know you guys are busy, but I'm hoping to take some beer home for, I'm having some folks over to my farm to play Coob. Are you oh, guys familiar? Awesome. Yep. You guys know yeah. <laughs> you, you, can't, you have to know Coob if you're doing biking beer, yeah, right? <laughs> Well, thanks, guys. This has been just fantastic. Can't wait to share your beer with the friends um, having to the party. If you guys are around, come on down. Hang out with us. Oh, Great. Love to be there. Okay, super. Well, here's your beer. Great. Have a good afternoon. You too. You too. Bye. Bye. Hi, I'm Inga Witcher. I'm Mark Shepard. Please meet nice you. Nice to meet you. I think what you're doing at your farm is just amazing. It's been so inspiring to me. My husband and I just have a 30 acre farm. I've been farming now for about seven years and everybody said you should till up your pastures and replant and this is what you should plant. And I think I heard Joel Salatin or something say, if it grows in the ditches, that's what you should be growing right. on your farm because you don't have to. And I, so that's what I did and it was like, oh, well that's great. But number one, I didn't have any money to, to do anything. And so it worked out just having the pasture there. In the ditches, uh, the brush that's growing up are hazelnuts, wild plum, wild roses, raspberries, grapes, gooseberries, probably some wild apples thrown in there here and there. So why not design a system just like the brush on the side of the road and the brush on the side of the road they try to mow it and they try to herbicide it every single year and it keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. That's sustainable agriculture. Yeah. The three-dimensional system I'm going to show you I think there's ten different crops in the same space uh, and it all started as a simple alley cropping system where we were growing annual produce in the alley and a row of chestnut trees. It started that simply and has over 20 years has evolved into what it, what it is now. So why don't we go take okay. a look at it. Hey you guys, where are you? Mark, standing here and looking at this pasture that the pigs are in, I would have thought that it would have been churned up and torn up, and you know how pigs can get. Part of why it's not so torn up is the breed. Uh, these are a mix of Tamworth mostly as their genetics. Tamworths really don't tear up pastures all that much. Mm -hmm. Part of that also has to do with the fact that they're extremely well fed. We're coming into the hazelnut season, they'll get all the hazelnut processing waste, they'll get the pressings from elderberries, the pressings from grapes, the pressings from apples, and then they finish finish on chestnuts, that's their final uh, finishing. So Mark, what is this, kind of the nutrition of some of these crops? Because in my dream world, I'd be able to grow enough perennial crops to feed my cows so I could cut down my $20,000 feed bill. Right, right. The hazelnut is more uh, nutritionally similar to a soybean and has three times the oil. Chestnuts are more similar to corn. Uh, actually, they're most similar to brown rice. So it's more like a grain that grows on a tree. Okay. It's a complete human diet. We, you know, we lack nothing if we eat only these plants, except, believe it or not, salt. Salt is naturally deficient in this diet. I think that's probably why humans have such a craving for salt is because mm -hmm. in a natural uh, environment eating the foods that are around us we are deficient in salt. Interesting. So you would still want to have your your mineral blocks mm -hmm. out in your pasture for your mm -hmm. for your cattle. So permaculture is basically just paying attention to what's happening on the land and allowing those things to happen. 
Uh, in a certain sense, in, in the, the subtle distinction between permaculture and restoration agriculture, which is more of what I practice, uh -huh. is restoration agriculture is uh, ecosystem mimicry. If you're, if you're living in you know, central Canada, there's going to be different species that will thrive there all by themselves than if you're down in Louisiana. Okay. Permaculture will make assemblages, somewhat artificial assemblages of useful plants and plant them, whereas I'm imitating natural plant communities. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen a lot of photos of your farm during years where we've had drought all over Wisconsin, and it seems like you're always green here. Right. How are you holding so much water into your soil? Plants can grow without uh, all kinds of different minerals. They can grow in deficient soil on all different sorts of things. The one thing they can't live without is water. Our hands together are like uh, a valley, ridge and valley system. Here's this main ridge with the hills and saddles, the main valley going down the middle. So what we do is starting up here at these points, these are called key points. We make a tiny depression in the ground and then we make a uh, little diversion uh, terraces that now draw the water slightly downhill but toward the ridge. Oh, okay. And so the whole entire uh, property becomes these reverse herring bones. When the water now pours on my hand, if it tries to concentrate in this little valley, it gets pulled out to the ridge. Wow. And so it ends up being these big zigzaggies all across the land. I see what a lot of folks, uh, whether putting in perennial or uh, annual crops like corn or beans or something, they seem to be taking out all the trees along their hedgerows. Maybe they're worried about the shade or something, but it seems like in our pastures anyway, if we have a little bit of shade, things grow a little bit better. Do you notice well, that too? Well, actually, yeah. And, and the University of Missouri Columbia um, Agroforest School of Agroforestry has done extensive research on uh, agroforestry systems and a partial shade actually increases yields. Oh, no. Annual plants are plants that you plant the seed in the springtime and you harvest in the fall, three or four months of growth, and then it's dead, it dies. Okay. And in order to get an annual plant established, you have to destroy an ecosystem that was there, a forest or a prairie. You have to disturb the soil either with tillage or with herbicide in order to get your plants to grow. So you have to kill nature in order to get agriculture to happen. Establishment costs actually for establishing a farm like this would be less than uh, starting a dairy would be. Okay. Uh, but what it doesn't have is the immediate cash flow that a dairy does have mm -hmm. um, unless you use some of the agroforestry techniques which is how we first got established. And what's the agroforestry techniques? The ones that, ones that we use the most, the uh, uh, primary one was alley cropping where we would grow our our alley crop, let's say corn or beans. I've okay. actually grown corn and beans here in the early years. You have your regular crop established and then you plant a row of trees spaced fairly wide apart so you can still get in there with your equipment. In the early years, your trees are small. They're not yielding anything anyway, so your cash flow is coming from your, your annual crops, your corn or your beans. Okay. Then as the woody plants mature, like these hazels, mm -hmm. uh, then you uh, don't need as much of your alley crop and so you can continue to close in the rows, close in the rows until you're, you know, 90 to 100 percent perennial crops. Okay. My cows love to eat leaves of trees. They, they just reach their heads out like as far as they can absolutely go like a giraffe or something and they just love it. That's right. Is, what is that about? They, well, they're, they're natural, they're natural browsers and grazers and we use that, that, that behavior as a tool. We're using them as a management tool. We're not doing cattle as our enterprise or pigs as our enterprise. They're management tools so how we can manage the system uh, with low labor and low equipment costs. Mm -hmm. We'll turn the animals into an area and they'll browse. Um, okay. Very few branches down low. Mm -hmm. Apples, very few branches down low because the cows go in and they tear all the branches off. Most people would look at that and say, oh my goodness, the animals are damaging the trees. All of the trees in our part of Wisconsin here, uh, in the savanna biome, uh, are accustomed to abusive grazing and browsing by wild animals and by fire, and, and to fire. So you can cut these trees down and they sprout right back and will continue to produce. Well, thank you, Inga, for coming to New Forest Farm. Here's a parting gift of some hazelnuts and a shepherd's hard cider box. Nice, I would have taken the hard cider, Mark, but I'll, th these are gonna be perfect for the veggie burgers I'm making. Good, enjoy. All right, great, well, anytime you're up in Osseo, please stop by my farm. I'll do that. All Thanks right. again. Have a great Enjoy. day.
get started cooking here before everybody shows up. I love veggie burgers. You know, I grew up partially vegetarian. My, my father was vegetarian. My mom cooked vegetarian a lot. And so veggie burgers were always something that we'd incorporate in. And I thought this would be a nice recipe to be able to share with people and use these wonderful Midwestern ingredients. So to start with, we're gonna take an onion and just saute it up in the pan. Let's see here. Oh, I better add my oil first. Uh, and I'm just going to use sunflower oil because I'm going to be frying the patties again. And I like that. Uh, you can use sunflower oil for higher heat. Okay. And with the onions, you want to sweat them. You don't, we're not going to saute these up until they're all the way cooked. We're just going to sweat those onions to, to get that flavor out. And this is going to be part of our mixture. Those onions are going to take about five minutes or so to, to just get nice and soft. And then I can add the garlic right to there. And salt and pepper, we're going to add right to here. A little bit of tamari. And let's stir that around just a bit here. And then I'm just gonna add a little bit of thyme for the herbs here. It's just something that I had in the garden, so I thought it would go nicely. But you could even add other things like cumin or, uh, I don't know, rosemary. ginger, rosemary. Just have fun with it. And then just give that a good stir and just incorporate it nicely. That's looking good. Okay, we're ready to take that off. Not a lot of cooking for the preparation in this recipe. Woo. I love cooking with these cast iron skillets, but I always forget that yeah, how heavy they are, number one, and how they the handles are hot too. Yikes. In we go. Okay, but I gotta start doing some more lifting. I'm getting a little bit weak. I'm gonna set that back on the heat because I'm gonna use that pan again in a second. And now I'm gonna add the, the nuts that are gonna create this burger. I just took a cup of those uh, hazelnuts and ran them through my food processor and got them so they're not, they, you know, they're not all the way processed. But there's still a few chunks in there, which tastes good. I'll add that right to my bowl here. And I had some wild rice left over from dinner last night. And wild rice is so Midwestern and it's a wonderful addition to these burgers. At least I hope so. I haven't tried it yet, but I, I think it'll be delicious. Uh, so we'll add a little bit of cooked wild rice and some cheese. And I just use a cheddar cheese. Oh, that's looking good. And some breadcrumbs. And you should just make your own breadcrumbs. It's so easy to make breadcrumbs. So everybody should practice making breadcrumbs. Okay, now let me crack an egg. Okay, and let's get this all mixed together. Let's see. And it's looking like I might need one more egg to bind this all together with. So let me go grab that. Thank you, Mrs. Hensley. Let me wash my hands off. Okay, clean hands, let's make the patties. And actually, I'm gonna mix this up a little bit more with my hands, just to get everything incorporated. I, I'm gonna fry these today, but I also saw that you could put them in the oven and bake them. Uh, and that's a good idea, because sometimes with veggie burgers, they fall apart really easy. And that's always one of the things that I always struggle with, but hopefully these will be able to be okay. I hope. <laughs> let's all cross our fingers. Okay. I kind of like making food like this where you kind of get to get dirty and use your hands a lot. Okay, I'm going to add a lot of uh, oil back to the pan so it doesn't stick here. And let's all just think really good thoughts so these hold together. I'm going to do one at a time. Okay. And you want the pan to be hot so that it sears the bottom and that's going to help that burger stay together better. These are looking good. Well, they held together. That's a good start. Okay. Well, they look like they're turning out pretty well. So I'm just gonna finish up here and then I'll meet you at the party after I put the trimmings on these beautiful Wisconsin hazelnut burgers. Serve your hazelnut burgers with your crusty buns and all your favorite fixins. Deviled eggs and pickled vegetables go great at any kind of a shindig. Make sure to have root beer on hand for the younger set. 
Wild apple tarts with cinnamon scented whipped cream are a perfect ending for this party. bringing the party to you and gather with us next time around the farm table Funding for Around the Farm Table is provided in part by Wisconsin Farmers Union, a member-driven organization for family farmers, rural communities, and all people. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. Information at wisconsinfarmersunion.com.